we just I like looking at the meaning behind music. We sing a lot of songs, and I think a lot of times we engage things, and we don't know what we're singing. We don't know why we're singing. Um, today's song, it's a, it's a song that I, I want to discuss. It's one that we've only sung a, a few times here, but um, as I was wrestling with my sermon, I realized this was a little bit more challenging to define uh, than I recognized. Have you ever been in a situation where you're talking to someone and you're trying to explain something and words are hard to come up with what you're trying to explain. Like the more you talk, the you think you've got it figured out. Like if you start to explain love to someone and then all of a sudden it becomes layers on layers. Or I was thinking maybe even the context, if someone asked you about the Nebraska Huskers of like the 1980s and 90s, I think we would talk for a while. But then if I said, hey, stop and just give me like after you talk for 35 minutes and um, puff your chest and get all excited about what was. Um, if I said stop for a second and explain it in like three words so my kids could understand it. Uh, then it becomes a little bit more challenging. Now, I know someone is going to come to me after church today and tell me the 1990 Cornhuskers in three words, and I will just challenge you with this. If you can do that with the Huskers, then you can do it with the things of God, so I'm just going to leave it there. Uh, but that's besides the point. Yeah, that was a tough one, Courtney, I know. Um, so this week, I, I want to focus on the song that that we just sang. Um, it's called Echo Holy. And, um, you know, when we look at it on the surface, I think it might have one meaning and and again, as we look at it deeper and deeper, I think there's some layers to this song. Uh, there's some pieces of meaning to this song. Um, so it, it starts off uh, with a pretty significant biblical connection. Gathered at the highest throne, welcomed by a melody, an anthem I have always known, a song that's always been in me, all glory and honor and dominion and power to you. It says a million angels fall face down on the floor, all to echo, uh, holy is the Lord. And uh, this portion of the psalm, obviously, or uh, it should take us to a very specific place in Scripture. It takes us to a, sp a place that, that actually there's a prophecy about. Um, we sing sometimes a song, I Can Only Imagine, right? And it's supposed to take us, what, to the time when we were in heaven with the Lord, and it, you know, I can only imagine what it's going to be like. And I, I believe that the beginning of this song is, is really intended to do kind of a, a similar Thing. And so we're gathered where at the highest throne. Um, there's a song, obviously, there's something going on, and there's a million angels falling on the floor. And this should be reminiscent if you've read the book of Revelation of a prophecy that was given to John. So the book of Revelation, it's a prophecy of Jesus Christ unto, unto John that he gives. Um, and when John gives that prophecy, what's happening is the church, this is a pretty consistent theme in Scripture. The church is under incredible persecution. This time it's under the emperor Domitian. Um, and God has given John a picture. And his picture, the whole point, Revelation, we can get so consumed in even what we read in a little bit. There's going to be some stuff that it's like, I mean, what is that saying? There's pictures and illustrations and, you know, brains can get wrapped up with. And sometimes people become consumed with figuring out the meaning behind it, which is great if that's you. For me, I just got to take it as a whole. Anyway, um, but I think the point of Revelation, the point of this revelation given to John was, was to bring encouragement to a people to know the outcome of God. So they know how the story ends. You know, like, uh, again, it's one thing to watch a football game. And when you're recording a football game uh, that you don't want to know the score of, what do you do? Like, you just don't want to know how it ends because it changes the way you watch it. And if you knew they won, you wouldn't get so worked up. Well, I think that's the whole point of what John's revelation is, is he's given the church a picture of what's going to happen. It's giving them a picture of the victory that's coming. So part of that picture can be found in the book of Revelation chapter 4. And so hopefully this sounds familiar to the words that I just read here. I'll get there. After this, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I'll show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald and encircled the throne. Surrounding the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders, and they were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. 
Uh, from the throne came flashes of lightnings. There was rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, there were seven lamps blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. Also in front of the throne was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center, around the throne, were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in the front and back. And in the first creature was like a lion, the second was like an ox, the third had a face like a man, the fourth was like a flying eagle. Each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered uh, with eyes all around, even under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Aren't you glad that they, they condensed the song and we're not singing about the animals and the beasts and all this stuff? I mean, there, there's something to that. But, but the song that they sang was holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Whenever the living creatures give glory, honor, and thanks to him who sits on the throne and him who lives forever and ever, 24 others fall, fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They lay their crowns before the throne and say, you're worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory, honor, and power. For you create all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. So, so this song, it begins and it points us to this place in the future. A time where, I, I mean, again, to fathom what this looks like, I don't know that we can fully comprehend. All I can say is there was some incredible worship and acknowledgement of who God is and what God has done, and it's causing this remarkable moment in time, right? I mean, that's what we can see from this. And we're told, and I, I, it was pointed out, um, we're just told that angels will declare or they will say the phrase, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. The song is called Echo Holy. And so Pastor being pastor said, if the angels are declaring that and we are echoing that, we probably should know what we're echoing, right? What does it mean? We have a joke in Sunday school. I guess in a couple of weeks, I've I've said a couple of words and my wife, she'll ask me what, and then she'll ask me why. Um, a few weeks ago, I said the word curmudgeon, right? If anyone's a friend with Dale McCrode, he now has a hat that says Mr. Curmudgeon on it. Um, but when I used the word, it was like, hey, we got to stop and we got to define this word. Like, what does that word really, really mean? And um, and then uh, symbiotic, I think, was the word I used last week. And they were my wife just said I had to stop and explain uh, what that means. But it's important for us, for understanding and engagement, to be able to know what we're doing. If we don't know what holy is, if we don't know what we're singing, then how do we worship? Does that make sense? And so I'm just going to pause for a second, and I'm, I'm going to give some answers here in a little bit, but, but if someone were to approach you, I, I went out on Facebook, I've talked to three different pastors this week, I've asked this question time and time again, I thought this sermon was going to be really easy, and then it got more and more complicated, and I'll be very candid, I don't know if I have the answer today. For what is holy? I have several answers, but I don't know if I have the answer. Anyway, I want to ask you the question. What does it mean for you to say holy is the Lord? So what is that holy? You describing God. When you say to someone, or when we sing the song, we just sing the song, echo holy, and we're saying holy, holy, holy is the Lord. What? does that word holy mean? I'll get there, Angie. Yeah. No, that was good, Angie. Thank you. I think there are some things that seem so simple but at times as we start to look at them, all of a sudden they become a little bit more complicated. I did put it on Facebook because I figured, hey, we talk about a lot of things on Facebook. Let's talk about the Lord for a little bit. And I just asked that same question on Facebook. I just said to people, hey, for you, when you say God is holy, what are you saying? And these are the responses I got. It's interesting because none of them, they all are similar, but they're not the same answer. 
Um, the first person who responded said, uh, God, the Father is perfection. And I love it because I asked for a definition, but cannot be comprehended by the human mind and he's untouchable by the human hand. That's like when you go to math class and your teacher says, hey, we're going to talk about something. You're never going to understand it and it's not going to make sense, but we're going to do it anyway. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's where we were at. Um, his supernatural, uh, some of these I had to kind of condense. They mentioned his supernatural awesomeness. That's the anti, that's your presence there. Fullness that doesn't contain sin. Someone else said, when we say God is holy, we're saying he is blameless without sin, and we're in awe of him. He, it seems to me, as with many things in Revelation, it's a reverence. There's a word from Sunday school uh, that is hard to describe. Words fall short when describing the majesty and righteousness of God. I love this because I, I feel like this person went through the same reality I was going through. They started to answer the question, and then they said, wait a minute, this is a really hard question because words fall short when I'm trying to accomplish the task that's set before me. To me, to call God, this isn't me, this was someone else, to call God holy is almost a breathless, I love it, declaration of his exalted place in creation. After you do it once, you do it again. And letting it sink in, after, and after a pause of wonderment, you repeat it a third time. I'll pause right there and say, yeah, when we're reading scripture and something's repeated a few times, it's probably important to pay attention, right? Because as I'm talking about this, and we'll get back to these definitions, the reality was the angels could be declaring anything. And that caused me to stop and think, really focusing. I mean, if I'm going to say something about God forever, man, God is, God is love, might be where I stand. Like, like if I'm going to say something about God, God is, God is gracious, God is, God is merciful, God is good. You know, we're going we're gonna to sing about those things. But, but the angels, they chose to, 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 to declare what? The holiness of God, not once, not twice. But three times, all I can say is God is, God is holy. Someone else, they gave me the three words. They answered it just sacred, pure, and perfect. We'll keep going like no other, complete, uh, without blemish. A purifying fire that consumes you. The totality of all that God is. He's omnipotent and omnipresent. He's a God who has always been with no beginning and will have no end. He's perfection and uniqueness of God. That's the holiness, is, is the perfection and uniqueness of God. It's interesting. I did this because sometimes I think it's valuable to have a conversation to understand things, right? You may see some of those and you may say, man, that resonates with me. And you may see some others and you say, I'm not so sure about that one. But part of us growing in faith, part of us coming to understanding is what can be accomplished when we actually have a conversation. And sometimes it's good to listen to the conversation as you participate in the conversation. Does that make sense what I'm saying there? And so if I'm trying to discover the holiness of God, I just wanted to hear from, from, from the people, from the body of Christ, whoever wanted to respond. Actually, it didn't have to be. It was my Facebook friends, whoever wanted to contribute, or, or others that I talked to throughout the week, like to be a part of this, this conversation about what it means to say the holiness of God. Because see, when I started studying, this was in the Baker Theological Dictionary. Look at how it starts on holiness. I mean, I should have just shut the book right at the beginning, right? What is holiness? One does not define God. You can't a dictionary. No, I mean, that's you're supposed to give me the easy answer to the question that I'm answer, asking. And the easy answer was, this isn't going to be an easy task. One doesn't define God. Similarly, the idea of holiness is at once... Understandable. All right. I like that. And also elusive. But I don't like that. I, I said this before. I'm a math guy. Things have to have an answer, and it's supposed to be clear. And and, and this resource told me that that as I look at the answer, I'm gonna I'm gonna have pictures of what it is, but also those pictures are going to then be elusive when I try to put my finger on it. Hornus speaks of God as supra-worldly. 
as other, as one virtually unapproachable in majesty. Those are big words. Uh, separation, this was another commentary series that, that I was reading, separation of God to accomplish his divine plan for all of us in creation or for all of creation. The basic idea is separation, but it includes both a separation from and a separation to. I'll pause right there. The root word hagios in Greek literally means to be separate from. When, it, when that's the word that's interpreted. So this dictionary focused on separation, but it said it's not just separation from, because we see that, like God is separate, you know, in the holies, but but separation to. There's an intentionality in his separation. To put it another way, the two aspects must be characterized by the two words difference and dedication. So we're separated from, that means we're different, but we're also separated to, that means we're dedicated to. So when we think that God is dedicated to us and all that God has done is, is for our, our well-being, our eternal nature, it's a dedication, not, not just separation from, but a dedication to us. His holiness, it makes us, he makes us, or makes him completely different from creation, also from the fallen world in order uh, that, or that has been marred by sin. He is completely dedicated to the carrying out of his great will and plan. God is utterly, I love this, dependable. He's not changing and he's perfect in all his ways. He's dedicated to us and he's not changing. And that dedication to us, the plan of God, the purpose of God is wrapped up in, in this idea that God is holy. And so when I'm singing of his holiness, I'm not just singing of, 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 of his character, but I'm, I'm singing of the fullness of, of who he is. Pastor Steve's answer, because I showed a whole bunch of other ones already. Here's what I came up with, and I know it's not complete. To declare God is holy, you're describing his entire nature, the perfection and uniqueness that he is. God is set apart from this world. Literally, uh, the literal meaning of this word holiness, that difference is something to worship, but his uniqueness compels him to want us to be holy also. The holiness of God, I think, is so hard to comprehend because I think it's the fullness of who God is. I don't think it's just an aspect or a nature of who he is. I think it's all that God is. Remember, in the New Testament, this word holy, more often than not, do you know who it's used to refer to? Take a gant, guess. The word holy in the New Testament, who it's used more often than not to refer to? God's people. Maybe the Holy Spirit. Maybe that one probably would, it would be, it'd be close. But in all throughout the New Testament, God has called us his holy ones. We're the ones that are set apart. We're the image, right, of Christ. That's who we become. And we're created, and, and when we become holiness, we are the image of that. And so ultimately, this idea, I, I said, as a pastor, I, I wrestle this morning. I really wrestle. Because I wanted to make it as clear as can be. And I feel like my task today is not to make it clear, but to cause you to search. Like my job today isn't to give you the answer for what holiness is, because I think if it was that easy, then we wouldn't look even deeper. But my job today, the calling that God has placed before me is, as we're approaching this song, as I've, I've approached this week, is the reality that I think God is wanting me to, to use me to cause you to say, I want to look a little further. I want to look a little deeper into this. Uh, one note I had said that it, I, I think this is, is so hard because perfection is hard to comprehend in the midst of imperfection. Does that, does that make sense? Like to comprehend perfection, that's the fullness of who God is, with imperfection, that's the brokenness of this world, I think, is a really difficult task that at times it takes it takes revelation. It takes uh, 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 things to come over time. So we can say, Pastor, you're going a really far away into just this simple. I mean, all you point out was scripture was showing that angels were saying holy is the Lord. It doesn't matter because angels are the ones saying it, right? Like, I mean, so what's it matter? They can say whatever they want. I'm not. But, but I think this is something bigger than that. This picture in Scripture is something fuller uh, than that. 
The song then says, my heart, and because of this, can't help but sing with all of heaven roar, forever echo, holy is the Lord. Now, uh, I want to go back to Revelation. What words did the angels speak in Revelation? This isn't, a, this isn't a hard question. They said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. So I think there's something about who God is in this declaration, right? The angels are proclaiming the lordship of God, right? And so for us, for all of us, we have an opportunity to proclaim that Jesus Christ is, is Lord. And then we proclaim the lordship of Jesus Christ. I think it helps us begin to recognize what God is doing. Romans chapter 10, I've talked about this before. If you declare with your mouth, what? Jesus Christ is Lord, and you believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified. It's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is the Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For what? Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I think that we're all a part of, of this chorus. The way we become a part of it is the declaration of Jesus Christ as Lord. I promise if you have not declared Jesus Christ as Lord, you're probably not participating in this, in this uh, eternal moment that we're, we're defining right now, right? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ's Lordship that allowed me to begin to discover the holiness, the perfection, the fullness of who God is. When I understand who God was, when I understand his love, when I understand the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, I, I didn't necessarily need to cry out, holy is the Lord. I'm guessing there's not a lot of people in the world that, 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 that cry out, holy is the Lord. But as believers, it should be a declaration of our heart. It should be a declaration of our mouth, the, 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 the crying out of the effect or the response to the perfection or the presence of God, right? Not only do we, we cry out, Jesus is the Lord, uh, but this line really compelled me, memorized by every heart, written in eternity, every lifted voice apart is joining in the symphony. Last week, last week, two weeks ago, we sang this song. And I was sitting here in church and I started thinking about an eternal symphony. I'm not a recording artist and I will never be a recording artist. I'll just say that. Um, but, you know, I've seen things where people record music and what do they do? Like they're in the studio, right? And they go in and they pick up one instrument and they play a track and they record that one instrument, right? And then someone else goes in or, or they go in. I got, a, I got a guy I went to high school with and he does a cappella, And so he's got like nine screens on, on the screen. It's him singing each of the different parts of, of a song. And then he puts them all together and then they play the song. Isn't that what studio artists do? They like record a part or a track. And it doesn't matter time and it doesn't matter place. All that matters is the song that is sung, right? And then what someone does is they take each of the lines of that song and they lay it on top of each other. And suddenly the individual parts become this incredible symphony. And when I was thinking about that, I thought about the eternal nature of the song that's being sung. And, and the cool thing is, actually, Isaiah chapter 6, you might have gone there too. Why? Because we see the same song in a prophecy that Isaiah had. Thousands of years before John had his prophecy. And what did Isaiah's prophecy say? In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seen exalted, seated on a throne, in the train of his throne for the temple. It sounds pretty familiar. One would argue that did Isaiah and John see the same thing? Above him were seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they were flying. And they were calling to one another. Guess what they were saying? Holy. 
holy. Holy is the Lord. The whole earth is filled with glory. The sound of their voices, the doorposts and thresholds shook, and the temple was was filled with smoke. I, I think it's absolutely incredible to catch a glimpse that I'm part of the eternal symphony that is praising the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Like to think, and, and again, my brain, sometimes I get that reset button, like just get stuck in loops when I start thinking of the eternal things of God. It just, it, I can't fathom it. But I get glimpses of the reality that I can stand in a church on Sunday morning and sing a song that is part of an eternal chorus that's crying out for all generations, for all all people crying out to God. Like that that in this moment that I can be a part of, of something way bigger than even this room or this body, but that the people of God, as they begin to cry out about the holiness of God, that it becomes a symphony that rises up to God, that is nothing but incredible, is nothing but remarkable, that is beyond my comprehension or even understanding. What we're participating in when we sing worship to God, I don't believe is just specific to this moment, but I believe it's an eternal thing that is reigning forever and ever. It goes beyond the confines of, of this moment and this place, it's something much bigger, much greater, much more diverse than the moment in which we're living. Why? Revelation 7 says, After this I looked, and before me there was a great multitude that no one could count. I recognize this is Revelation saints, but one from every nation, people from every tribe, people in language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white, robe, white robes and were holding their palm branches in their hand, and they began to cry out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, Him who sits on the throne and, and to the Lamb. And the angels were standing around the throne with the elders and the four living creatures, and they fell down on their faces before the throne and were worship God saying, amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. I believe that when we echo holy, we're participating in eternal worship of our God. I was talking to a friend of mine this week and he gave me this illustration. I'll give Leroy credit. He said, we were talking about holiness, and he said, you know, Steve, it's kind of like, Walt will relate to this better than I do. He said, it's like a mountain lake in Colorado. He said, you know, you get up to that lake, and you start looking down, and it's so clear, but you're convinced that lake is only a foot deep. And he said, it's so clear that, that you're convinced that, that that's only one foot deep. But he said, but as you engage it, as you explore it, maybe as you step into it, what happens? One foot becomes 12 feet because of how clear and pure the water is. That's what happens when we begin to engage the holiness of God. We may have a clarity that only looks one inch or 12 inches deep, but as we begin to engage that, as we begin to step into that, suddenly we're overwhelmed. We're in over our head. Sometimes we're not even sure we were we were hunting yesterday, right, Walt? And he was laughing, and it wasn't clear, so it's not a clear an analogy. But his dog was with us, and, and his dog was running through all the places we didn't want to walk because that's the good thing about a bird dog is they do all the work, and you just get to walk and pull the trigger. Anyway, and so he was laughing. Walt was laughing. He said, did you see Kit? No, because he was way far away. He said, Kit was jumping in this, and there were these cattails everywhere, and the water was real murky. He said, Kit was jumping and hit this one spot, and I mean, completely underneath the water in mud and muck and whatever else, because, because Kit had no idea. Where Kit was stepping. I think that's what happens when we begin to step into the holiness of God. I'm going to warn you, Kit didn't have a warning. I promise you, as you step into this, man, there's going to be a time when you start reaching, because I'm not going to step in that mountain water, because I know it's cold. So I'm probably going to bend down, and I'm just going to put my hand down there and try and reach the bottom. There's going to be a time where you start reaching, and you can't touch the bottom. And I'm human, 
So I'm going to want to figure out how deep that is. So I'm probably going to go grab a stick. Cheryl's got a stick right there, and I'm going to take that stick, and I'm going to put it in that water and see if I can touch the bottom. This is only a mountain lake. It doesn't matter. But if I can't hit the bottom, I'm going to do whatever I can to figure out how deep this lake is. I might even just jump in. I believe that's what happens when we begin to echo, holy is the Lord. You know, um, it wasn't planned. My wife today, as she was leading worship, right? There was a moment where she couldn't sing anymore. Why? Because she was singing about the holiness of God. And sometimes when you start thinking about something that is so good, when you start thinking about something that is so real, when you start thinking about something that is so much beyond your comprehension, there's nothing you can do in that moment. You may not be able to cry out anymore, but you may just cry. You may fall just like the elephant on the ground. You may be in awe of the moment. That's a completely free response to the holiness of God. You guys can come forward. Now that I said she cried, now she's got to sing again. <laughs> I want us to conclude today just singing this song again. My heart is that as we sing the song, you think about what does it mean when I talk about holy is the Lord? But you think about what what answer maybe you had, one of those answers that was on the screen or one that you came up with that's much better than anything Patrick came up with this week. But you reflect on the holiness of God. I pray that what is shallow can become just a little deeper. I pray that what maybe seems so clear to you right now, that as you begin to investigate, you might see there's so much more depth. You might hunger and thirst to experience just a little more of, of his, his holiness. Father, this morning in this place, I believe that we get to join in that eternal choir of praise. I pray for us in this room, Lord. I pray that every one of us, if, if, if we need to, we can acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord. That means that once I had sin in my life, that sin needed forgiveness. That forgiveness came through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. But he's now my Lord. He's in charge. He calls the shots. Because of his lordship, I start to recognize what he brought me out of. how dedicated he was to me to send Jesus Christ for my sin. How much he longed for separation from this world. And he said, there's only one way for this to be made complete. And that's through my son, Jesus, going to a cross to die for Steve's sin. And God, as I look at you, can't help but cry about your perfection. Can't help but join in the chorus that cries out, holy is the Lord. God, take me into the depths of your holiness. In this place, take us into the depths of what it means that you are a holy God. Father, it's in Jesus' name I pray. As they're leading this chorus, I'll be here. I encourage you to engage the chorus, but if you have a need in your life, I know sometimes we need to get stuff out of the way before we can engage in these things. And if there's a situation or circumstance you're facing, if there's a, a need that you have as a pastor, I'll be here to pray with you. If not, Engage in this song. Engage in this worship. God is, God is holy. It's who he is. He longs for you to know him. Every part. Every detail. I encourage you this week, this, this month, this year, whatever it takes to, to go just a little bit deeper 
in your understanding. To reach out just a little bit further in knowing. Because he's holy. The Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. May turn his face towards you. Grant you his peace. And may you grasp the unfathomable. And may you know the perfect of God. Amen? Be blessed.